So how many of you can remember when God, uh, am I, have you, you guys got me, is that? Okay, just want to make sure. Uh, how many of you can remember when God created the world, when you was able to watch all that take place? <laughs> Did anybody see that? Can you all remember the day that Jesus was crucified and then three days later he was raised from the cross and you, uh, raised from the grave and you, you saw him being raised from the dead? How many of you can remember that? <laughs> Not, right? Right? So there's a lot of things that we are asked to believe, right? Now, I was, I was watching, and I'm, I, I, I saw something this morning, and, and I heard Keith Moore say some things as I was getting ready for, for church this morning. And I thought to share this would be helpful in my introduction to what I want to do on this last message on this series. But I heard him, he was talking about this, and, it, and, and he was talking about that so many people... You know, they, there's the theory of evolution, and they, so they submit to those kind of things. But it's not really taught like that by people that say they believe that kind of thing. It's not really, it's not really presented as a theory. It's really presented as like science, science, science that this is the way the world was created. This is how old it was. This is how it happened. And you understand, nobody knows that, right? Yeah, I mean, as far as actual fact and knowledge and, and memory, being able to see that nobody was there when the world was created as far as that's living on the planet right now. And I was reminded, he, re, he reminded me that Kenneth Hagin, one of the things that Brother Hagin used to say about these kind of things, he says, you understand what a theory is, right? A theory is supposition based on ignorance of the topic or the matter being discussed. And you think about it, that's right. You don't have enough knowledge, so therefore it is supposition based upon what you don't know. And we are asked either to try to figure things out on our own and come up with supposition based upon the ignorance of the subject, or we're asked to believe. It's To me, it's a lot easier to believe in the things of God and, and not just creation, but all the, the things of God. It's easier for me to believe than it is for me to actually try to have supposition based upon my ignorance and saying, you ever meet people where they, they will fight you and argue with you over how the world was created and over how the plant, because they, after all, they have vast amounts of intelligence and you don't. <laughs> and to me, it's like when people start talking that kind of deal, they show their ignorance. They show their true ignorance. I at least admit I'm ignorant. I am ignorant of how any of this stuff works. I don't know how the world was done other than just to trust that what God said, that he spoke it in the world. I, I couldn't create the world. I couldn't know how, that, how far the, this planet is from that planet, the stars. Well, at our very best, at our very best, we're very limited on our ability to understand that's why the Lord says uh, it's above your pay grade. Just believe. Yes. Yep. And, but th th that's hard for folks because it means that they have to actually submit to their ignorance. Mm -hmm. yeah. They have to admit, I'm ignorant. Yep. And we, hate, we, we hate that. We hate that as human beings, we hate that. <laughs> we hate recognizing we don't know everything. How many of you really, truly realize you do not know everything? Right? We don't know a lot. But what we do know for fact and for a surety is what we can find based upon the Word of God. I've come to one conclusion. Go ahead and, uh, well, get, go ahead and open your Bibles to uh, 2 Corinthians 9. I'll get there in just a minute. I've come to one conclusion about 
trying to figure some things out about God, I've, I've come to this conclusion that I really, 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 if you guys don't care, uh, go ahead and put up Romans chapter 2, uh, verse 4. I, I really have come to, to believe that this is a very vital uh, scripture that has to be really talked about more and more. Because I think that we've tried to convince people about the way and why God does what He does and, and the reasons that He does certain things. And we've been tried to uh, be taught that, you know, to kind of scare people into a place of making a decision to follow God. And I, I get uh, the logic of all of that. But I don't think it's a very fair description of who God is. I'm not saying that there isn't something, a hell to shun and a heaven to recognize that you're going to gain. There is. But that cannot be the logic of what it is that drives you and pulls you to God. And God, in His infinite wisdom and intelligence, understands that. And that's why the, He got you know, uh, Paul to record this scripture when he's writing to the Roman church that, don't you know, it's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. In other words, he was trying to get across to us. This is how people get one, is not being coerced, not being to be made afraid of him, but rather to identify that he's good. He's just a good God and he's always interested in your well-being. And I think sometimes when people get saved in Christian circles, we have relegated God to be the God of salvation only. Now I appreciate salvation. If you don't ever get anything else, obviously get that. Because that's the key to eternal life. And there's many people, many Christians living today that do not have a, a concept that goes beyond the God of salvation. Meaning, meaning, when I say that, meaning the God of eternal life. That He saved you from dying and going to hell to get to heaven. And they don't know anything else. And they don't want to know anything else. In fact, sometimes if you talk about other things, about other benefits, so to speak... That, that comes with knowing God and walking with God, it, it's offensive to them. Because after all, it's totally about salvation. Now, please don't misunderstand me again. You, you, you got to have that, right? You got to believe that Jesus came away. And how do, you get, how do you get saved? Romans 10, 9 and 10 tells us that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and the, with, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Certainly, that's the criteria and that's the expectation for every person that God wants to come to the knowledge of that Romans 2, 4 scripture that it's the goodness of God and they see that He's good and they, they go, I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and I confess that out of my mouth and therefore I'm saved. He obviously wants us to get to that place. But are there other things that God wants for me and you? And I submit to you very uh, emphatically this morning that the answer to that is yes and yes. I believe that God is a good God. And if He's a good God, if you really submit to the fact that He's a good God, then you know that He wants more for you. Yes, we, He wants heaven. And this is, the, this is the most temporary thing you'll ever do in your, in your entire life. There will come a moment where this thing that we're doing right now comes to an end, and I don't know whatever number that is for everybody, but it's going to come to an end. And it's not really something to be like afraid. I get it that there's the unknown in our minds like, I know I'm going to heaven, but I don't know what that looks like, and, and it feels like separation, and it is in one sense. But this is the most temporary thing you'll ever do in your entire existence. God created you, and he, not, not your physical body, but he created you. He did that too, but I'm talking about your spirit. Your spirit's going to live forever, and there'll come a moment where your spirit actually gets to get hooked, be hooked up with a body that can relate to the spirit. Amen. This body doesn't relate to the spirit right now because your spirit is forever, and your body isn't. It's corruptible. It comes to a conclusion, an end. And there's going to come a moment where all that's going to happen. Well, but you have to ask yourself, but while I live in this life right now, does God want anything else for me besides to be saved? Was I born just to be saved? Because that's the way some people think. And I believe that you were born not just to be saved, certainly that, but 
Um, I also believe that God, and I, I believe I'm going to attempt to show you this in the scripture, that God also wants you to live a fruitful, a victorious, an outstanding, wonderful life. To the place to where when you take your last breath, you'll be able to look back and go, Lord, this was awesome. This was great. But I do know there is something greater. Rather than look back and say, Lord, I, this is awesome that I'm going to have. This has been miserable, terrible. Why did you even put me through all this? Why didn't you just immediately let me be born and die and go to heaven? I don't believe that's what God wants. I do believe that God wants to make things happen for us in our lives. And one of those things that I believe that God wants to make happen is provision for the things that you need in life. I think so many people live miserable lives because they don't understand and don't want to accept and, and embrace that God wants to help them. And so therefore, they just live it and they accept it and they believe somehow or another it's attached to God's will because you're going through it. Well, if that's the case, then you'd have to say, do you believe that God's will is for you to be sick? If you believe that, then you know you, you could say, well, I don't think God ever wants to take care of me. He just wants to get me to heaven. And I, as long as I hold out and hold on until the end, at least I'll get to heaven. And I experienced all these terrible things in life, uh, but I at least get to go to heaven. I don't believe that's the heart of God. And I don't believe that's what he shows himself to be uh, throughout the scriptures. And many people uh, get offended if you try to take away their concept of what life in their mind is supposed to look like. I'm supposed to not have enough. I'm supposed to be sick. And how dare you tell me anything different than that? Because I like being in my misery. That's, that's the way we are sometimes. But I believe that we need to also recognize, wait just a minute, maybe God wants something more for us. So let me attempt to jump into this and share some things that I believe is going to bless you, encourage you, and it might challenge you. And if it does, it's okay. Just allow yourself to be challenged. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 18 says, And you'll remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the power, you the, you the power, to get what? For you to get wealth so that He may establish His covenant, which He swore to His fathers as it is this day. It's like why He shares with us about the concept, if, you, if I can call it that, the concept of giving. Now, I'm not, we're not receiving an offering, so we're not, this has nothing to do with that. So don't, don't get deluded here. It's all about, he starts to show us how things work. Everything that you see that's recorded in the, in the scriptures all throughout from the Old Testament all the way up to Revelation, every bit of this is for mine and your benefit. Everything he's recorded is so that we can learn something from it. And you'll live an entire life. And even if you get as much as you think you could possibly get, it's still just scratching the surface as to the reality of the truth that really is available to us. But we can at least continue to strive to get a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And the more that we know, the more power that we get because the Scripture brings power to it. Now, in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6, he says something very similar to what he was trying to share there. Uh, that I just read in Deuteronomy, he says, but the, and, and what I had just stated, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, he that sows bountifully reaps bountifully. And so he's trying to show us that this is the way things work in the kingdom of God. We've talked about it in the past of where, how the kingdom of God is like really, not, it, it isn't like the same way in the world. The world says things like, don't you, I mean, why would you give your money to somebody or something? Why would you do that? It's, it's, I mean, it's yours after all. You worked hard for it. Why would you give it to them? Why would you do that? But yet, in the kingdom of God, he says, give, and what will happen? It, it'll be given to you. If you sow sparingly, then you'll reap sparingly. But if you sow bountifully, what will you get? You would reap bountifully as well. And then he tells us in John 10.10, laying just a little bit of groundwork for where I want to go. He says, The thief comes not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come that you might have life and just hold on and hang out till the end. And then when you get in the, uh, the here and now, the, the you know, afterlife, 
then you'll have life more abundantly. Is that what he said? No, he's giving you the, the insight that the thief wants to steal, to kill, and destroy your life. But I, talking about Jesus, have come so that you might have life and life more abundantly. Now, you can't mess that word up. What does abundantly mean? Abundant means a lot, more than enough. If you have an abundance of, you know, of food, it means you have more than you need. And so he's, he's giving the idea here, abundant life, meaning that I ha- I'm in position not just on one thing, but my whole life. Now, he doesn't relegate it to one thing here. He says that you, the thief comes to steal what? It could be all kinds of things. The, st- the thief wants to steal your health. But Jesus wants you to have health, life, and abundant health. Right? So you, every part of life. What's part of life? What, what identifies your life? Well, everything. Everything, yeah. Your health, your wealth, your relationships, your family, people in your life, everything. Everything that constitutes the makeup of your life, the thief wants to steal that. He wants to kill that. He wants to destroy that. But Jesus says, but I want you to have life Life over your finances as well as over your health. Life over your family and life over your relationships. And not only just life, but life more abundantly. And so this is what he's trying to get across to us. And then uh, he's trying to show us that how all this can work. Now the Lord begins to speak to people in different ways about these kind of things. I I know that for me, uh, the Lord, as I've shared with you all many times, it seems like, we have, I have a bathroom ministry. It just seems like that the Lord started this many years ago when he would speak to me. Most, many of the times, he'd either speak to me in my car or in the bathroom. Now, I don't understand that. But it's where I, sometimes I walk in and I'm, 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 I don't want to be too graphic or anything, but I might be on the throne or I might be in the shower. And the Lord begins to speak to me sometimes. In fact, sometimes, and I have my phone, I'll be typing the things that are coming into my spirit. So I don't forget them. Now this is the way that the Lord wants to talk to us. But the question is, are we going to listen? Because not everybody's the same. Do you think everybody gets saved the same as the next person? How many of you were saved in a church service? Would you raise your hand for me? How many of you were not saved in a church service? There's a difference. How many of you were saved in your home? How many of you were saved in your bathroom? I am, this is an exclusive ministry right here. Sitting in my bathroom, I committed myself to the Lord. I'm just being honest. So it's not, the point is it's not the same for everybody. God does different things in different ways for different people, but it's the same end result. Okay, so let's get that settled. And we talked a little bit about that last week in, in regards to healing. So I want to take it one more place here. And let's go over to 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 17. I have some interesting things to share with you. I think you're going to be really encouraged by some of these things I'm going to share within the Word. 1 Kings chapter 17 verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except my word. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Elijah, saying. Now watch. So God is speaking to Elijah. Now that's God's responsibility. Now it's Elijah's responsibility to hear and respond. It's not Elijah's responsibility to, to, to speak. That's God's responsibility. He speaks. Elijah listens. It's like the Lord's trying to tell us, this is the way the relationship works. I speak, you listen, and then you respond. Right. Amen. Well, i tell you what, if you don't get nothing else, if you get that, you, you, it was worth the price of admission just for that. Right. Yep. 
The word of the Lord came to him saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into Jordan, and it will be that, that you shall drink from the brook, and I've commanded the ravens to feed you there. Now, I don't know about any of you, but I have never had any birds bring me anything to eat. They usually want me to bring them something to eat, right? I, it's the funniest thing. Lauren, just she just don't like birds. And so we were at the beach one time, and we were out sitting on the sand, you know, and she's like most of the, the ladies, you know, they get out there and they just kind of, you know, they're gone, got the sunglasses on and resting. I'm basking, I'm resting before the Lord, you know. And uh, so I had some potato chips or something like that down there, and there's these seagulls everywhere. And all it takes is one time you drop a little crumb, brother, and I'm, they go tell all their friends. And they start coming. I start throwing some down. I'm throwing right beside Lauren. I have a little mean streak. And so here's three birds that come over, and she kind of hears them flapping, and she's like, you know, knocking, like, get, get away. Well, she'd lay back down, and I'd throw a few more. And here comes even more. Before it was done, there was like 25 or 30 birds, and she comes out of there and takes them sunglasses off. She's like, what is going on? And then she realizes what, I'm gonna, what I've been doing. She's like, Daddy, I hate birds. Stop that. Well, they didn't come bring me no chips. They were getting the chips. But yet, watch, God spoke to a bird. Do you know that God, I, I've come to one conclusion. God can do a whole lot even with, with animals. Maybe even more so with animals than humans. And that's, you know why? Because they don't have to submit their will. Humans actually have to submit the will. God speaks to them and they either say, yes, I will, or no, I won't. The birds just go, oh, sure. And they bring Elijah something to eat. Now that's really strange, but yet he provided for him by bringing a bird into a place to where he brought him food. I find that, now watch. You've read that lots of times. It don't seem that big a deal. You read over it and you go, yeah, the ravens. By... Well, what if that's you? What if you were Elijah? You don't have any previous stories to tell about birds bringing somebody something to eat. Do you think Elijah was like, really? That's odd. It's a weird thing. And then, and then, jump down to verse 8. He says, watch again. The word of the Lord came to him saying, Go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there, and I've commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose, he went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks, and he called to her and he said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he said, uh, Bring me something to eat. Bring me a piece of bread. And she said, As the Lord lives, I don't have any bread only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in the jar. And you see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go and prepare it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Literally, this is her, literally her last meal. We talk sometimes about, you know, last time we ate. I mean, this is literally, she's like, this is it. This is all I got. Don't know where I'd get any more. And I, I just, there's no way for me to, to come up with anything else to eat. She's given up. Now watch this. This is, a, this is a wild story. Now you've got to remember, you've read this story, you've heard this story, you've heard me preach about this story lots of times. Forget that for a minute. This is the first time it's ever happened. Watch what, what Elijah says. He said to her, don't be afraid, but go and do as I have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me and afterward for you and your son." So if you're the woman and you're hearing, make me first. Now you could look at that and go, them dang preachers. <laughs> them dang preachers always talking about bringing money. Yeah. Not only does he want money, he wants my last meal. Yeah. But what you have to realize is this. When Elijah said, do this for me, it was the same as God saying, do it for me. Amen. He's a representative of God. You know, 
years ago, I don't talk about it a whole lot, but many years ago, I got into business and, and have, have been involved in business things for be uh, 35 years this November. So long time. And, uh, and in business, uh, you usually create a company and come up with a company name and, and then, you know, you, you put how you're going to be, what, what the person that you are in the company, that kind of thing. And so I started a company called uh, Viking Food Mart. It wasn't because of the Minnesota Vikings or the show Vikings. It was because the school, it was a high school that was right up from this particular store. And when we first started out, me and a buddy, a friend of mine, that's my best friend still to this day, we decided that we were going to start a company, a, a, a convenience store, and we, we came up with something snappy. So we called it Snappy Mart. That was what it was going to be called, Snappy Mart. Quick. And I overheard the kids coming in, and they were saying, they were, they'd say, can we use the phone? They didn't have cell phones back in that day. I'll tell you how long ago that was. And they'd say, sir, can we use the phone? Yep, yep, you can use the phone. So we'd hand the phone on that side, and they'd dial, you know. Mom, can you pick me up? I'm down here at Viking Mart. Because it was the uh, Ram County Vikings. So I was like, ah. Oh. I said, man, we've got to change the name. We've got to change the name. So it became Viking Mart and stuck ever since. And then we started another company. It was called Victory Enterprises. And you know where that came from. I'm yeah. like, I'm living a, lick, a victorious life then it's going to be identified in the things that I do as well. Now, on those corporations, my name is on that as the president. I'm the president of those corporations. And when I speak, I am identified as, on their behalf, when I speak, I'm identified as Viking Food Mart or Victory Enterprises. It's, a, it's, it's like the company speaking. When the man of God speaks... It's the same as God speaking. God is speaking through the man, and he is a representative of the man. So therefore, it's the same thing as God speaking when he says, Go make for me first. Now, what was the significance of that? We, there's really two things that I believe that was the significance of him saying that. Number one, we see that the Bible tells us in Malachi, and through many other places as well. We won't take the time to get into that. don't want to get in the weeds. But in Malachi he says, um, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there'll be meat in my house. Well, a tithe is also much more than just 10%. The word tithe means 10%. But it's much more than that. A tithe is not really truly, it's, a tithe is a tithe by 10%, but it is more than the intention that God wanted with the tithe. You know, the tithe was meant to be the first part. That's why in the Old Testament he talks about the first fruits. In other words, if you wait to the very end, if, you're, if, if you feel compelled that you're going to tithe, and you go, all right, I'm a tither, and I just made uh, $10,000 this month, let's just say, and you, you go, okay, well, I'm going to wait till the end of the month, pay all my bills, and then you get at the end of the month, and you go, uh, I have $1,500 left. All right, go ahead and write that $1,000 check. I'm going to tithe. That is not the heart of God. There's no faith in that. Watch. What he's intending for us to do, now I'm, this isn't my whole point, but I'm still just trying to make a point. You get $10,000 and you just turn around and the first thing you do is write that $10,000 check. It now becomes a first fruit. Because now you're trusting that everything else is going to be okay. I don't know if I got enough. Think I got enough. Hope I got enough. But there's my first fruit gift. That's what he was trying to say to this lady. You give to the man of God first. And then you open my ability up that I can respond now. Because whatever man sows, that shall he also reap. If you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you reap bountifully, right? This is what he's trying to tell us in this, in this encounter as this lady comes into the, uh, the encounter of making the decision, do I give to him first or do I eat for me? What do you think happens if she fixes for her and her son? She says, sir, uh, I perceive that you're a false prophet and I'm telling you right now, you ain't taking my son's last meal. We're going to eat it and uh, you know what? I don't know what to tell you. I can get you some water, but I can't do much. I can't, I can't do anything for the meal. I'm not going to give my son's last meal to some man of God what do you think would happen 
I suspect she'd have got hungry real quick. And that may have been the very, truly, the last meal that she would have had. And so the Lord, I believe, is trying to show us some things within that. And then you even see when there was a, a, a magnitude of people gathered around with Jesus. And the disciples said, Lord, we better cut them loose. Let them go. We're a little ways from town. Let them go into town and get something to eat. They ain't eating for three days. They need to go get something to eat. And he said, well, why don't you all feed them? Well, he's like just paraphrasing. You know, the disciples look at him like, feed all these people? Where, where would we feed all these people from? What, what would we, where would we come up with that? And he says, well, fellas, okay. Go have them sit down 50 in fifth, groups of 50. Now, we know there were at a minimum 5,000 men, and it says not counting women and children. So I don't know how many, but 5,000, probably 10,000 anyway, maybe more. A lot of people, right? And he looks around and he says, what do we have? Well, all we have is two fish and five loaves of bread. Now, if you do the math on that, the odds of you getting much ain't good. Right? You ain't going to get much. But watch what Jesus does. Before he distributes anything, he blesses the food and he thanks God for what he has. Not what he don't have. And many times, how many times are we sitting there going, I ain't got this, I ain't got that, this, that person's got that, they've got that, I don't have that, I don't have that. And you ain't even, you're not thanking God for what you do have. And he's like, I can't do much for you till you be thankful for what you do have. And Jesus says, thank you, Lord. I bless the food. And they start distributing it. And it says by the end of the time that every single person that was there had eaten all they wanted, watch now, that they had 12 baskets of take-home left. Yep. Yep. And we're not talking like 12 baskets of Long John Silver's baskets. We're talking about baskets. Right. Yep. 12 baskets left. How does that happen? Is that, is that weird? Yep. Yep. That's really an odd thing. I mean, why didn't he just say, Wait just a minute, let's get some money together. Why didn't he say, believe God, let's believe God for money to come in so we can go buy it? I don't know. The problem is, is we get preconceived ideas about what it is that we expect God to do when we have a, a provisional need. And so we get it in our heads how everything's going to be, and it almost always is, I need a check in the mail. Something will just show up and the check will be in the mail and... It's somewhere, uh, it could be that. But you know that sometimes God gives people outstanding creative ideas or he puts them in positions of, of, to where somebody, uh, uh, they can have influence over somebody and they can help them in a different way. And then we look at it and we go, well, was that really the Lord? If you're blessed in any way, it was the Lord. Anything that's good that's happened to you, remember what he says. It's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. And then he also says God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So it's safe to say that God wants everybody to repent. So it's safe to say that God is good to everybody. So they will repent. They just have to recognize that he's good. And sometimes they think, well, that was just me. Well, that was just you. And we have to realize that it really isn't. I've come to this conclusion if you're willing to listen, then God's willing to talk. And I think sometimes we get that backwards. Well, I'd be willing to listen if God would talk. Well, do you, how about you just be willing to listen and then know that God will talk. And then when he talks and you hear, what's your responsibility after that? To respond and do what he says. Now, watch this. You can look for things all throughout the Bible and look how that God created provision for a variety of different people, and they're all odd. I mean, there's many odd things. I'll say it like that. Maybe not all, but there's many things that just are very strange, the way that the Lord provided for a need. There was a, a, a conversation one time that, was, that, that Jesus was having, and, and he says, well, I tell you, because they were talking about, Lord, should we pay tax? Should we pay any tax? And the Lord said, ah. I'll tell you what, go 
down and throw your line into the water. Go catch a fish. Now he could have said, well, Lord, we need a big catch so that we can create enough money to be able to pay our tax. Right? Because that's the way my mind would have thought. I'm a business guy, so I would have thought, well, I need to create a revenue source. So fish, people need to eat. So let me catch some fish, sell the fish, take the money, pay the tax. But Jesus says, just catch a fish and open his mouth. And then inside his mouth, mouth you'll find a coin. You take and you pay the tax for me and you. So obviously it was enough. It was a big enough coin. I don't mean in size, in value. It was a big enough coin to pay the tax for both. Now that's, that's strange. Who would have thought, hey, let's go catch fish and look for coins in their mouths. <laughs> now, we look at that and we read over it sometimes and it doesn't seem that significant. It doesn't seem that strange. Until you're the guy talking to Jesus for the first time and he tells you, go, catch the fish, open his mouth, take the coin, pay the tax you're probably going to be going, that is really strange. What's the odds of finding a coin in a fish's mouth to pay the tax that me and you need to pay? What's the odds? Uh, like zero? <laughs> but yet, that was the means that God created in order to pay his tax and to show him that he was... Jehovah Jireh. Before I get to the place I want to close with, I want to remind you though in Genesis chapter 2 and with this, go ahead and turn over to Genesis 30. Go to Genesis 30 and as you're getting there we'll, uh, let me just share a couple things. In Genesis 22, God had asked Abraham to take Isaac. Now you have to understand this, the significance of this because Isaac is like the promise. It's like Abraham's been waiting on Isaac a long time, right? Abraham was like a hundred years old. Sarah is around 90 before the, the, you know, she got this son and it was like, even then, even then, uh, people would look and go, 90 year old, uh, women getting pregnant, having babies? Even then. So he's waited a long time He's finally there. He's undoubtedly, you know, I don't know, I don't know the age, but I think that most scholars believe that he was more like somewhere around 10 to 12 years old, not a small child, not a grown man, but not a small child. And, and God tells Abraham, take him on a three-day journey. There's so much significance in this story. Three-day journey, well, what about three days? What do we know about three days? Take him on a three-day journey and offer him as a sacrifice for me. That sounds like somebody else I know that was yeah. the for, that 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 was going to happen in the future. And notice that Abraham doesn't question it. He doesn't try to figure out you know figure everything out. And that's part of our problem is we have preconceived ideas about trying to have to figure everything out. How am I going to get this done? How am I going to make provision? What's God going to do for provision? I know he'll send me a check in the mail. It might be like that. But how about just being open to anything? How about being open to a creative idea? I don't know how many times the Lord has given me an idea. And I don't mean like some big, uh, you know, uh, big monstrosity of an idea to, to, you know, do this or do that. But just something that's like anybody could do. And go, ah. Oh, that would work. That happens. God can give you all kinds of things in order to meet the provisions that you need in life. And why does he want you to be provided for? I feel like I need to kind of reiterate this. Why does he need, why does he want to make sure that you have provisions for what you need in life? Because he loves you. He's not a God that's like sitting back saying, I don't really care if they suffer or not. I mean, what more do you want? I'm giving you eternal life. You get to come to heaven a few years from now. You, and you actually want to have more than enough to eat? You want to live in a decent house? 
You don't want your car breaking down all the time? I mean, come on. What do you expect? You got heaven waiting? Isn't that the way that some people think, though? I, don't, I do not serve that God. That is not the God that I serve. The God that I serve wants provision for me. He, he, now, he doesn't want the provision to be above him. Because you can turn anything into an idol. He wants you to understand the significance of what you have is not more, than, more, more significant than the relationship that you have with him. There's nothing that can get in between that. But he's like, but if you can handle that, I, I'll do anything for you. I'll help you to enjoy. I have what you need. More than enough. And so he tells Abraham, he says, take your son Isaac, whom you love, and you take him to this place and you offer him as a, as a sacrifice to me. And Abraham says, come on, boy, we're going. Three days journey. And he's off and, the, and Isaac is looking around. He says um, something to this paraphrase. And he says, Dad, we've got the wood. We've got everything that we need for the sacrifice except the sacrifice. And Abraham said, son... God himself will make a sacrifice for us. He'll provide it for us. Now you know that story. He, he ties Isaac up, lays him on the wood, and pulls the knife back. With, and, and I know for an assurity that he was ready to plunge the knife into his body. I know that because the angel of the Lord had to yell out and say, Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't do that. Don't do that. For now I know you not withhold anything from me. The Lord speaking. And then he sees a, lamb, or a ram caught in the thicket. And from that day forward, that place was called Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. In other words, he provides whatever that you need. And then in Hebrews, you see that he was so committed to the sacrifice that Abraham said essentially inside of his mind, inside of his heart, if you kill him, if you let me kill him, you promised me he was the one. And if you can't let me kill him, you'll have to raise him from the dead. You'd have no choice. But see the significance tied to Jesus anyway. Three-day journey, offer the sacrifice. He, in his mind, in Abraham's mind, he was as good as dead. And then resurrected back to life. So you see the, the correlation there. Now watch this. He, so I wanted you to hear that. He said, from this day forward, this place will be called Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. I want you to walk out of here this morning knowing this. I want you to know that Jehovah Jireh is still alive. Amen. Just like Jehovah Rapha is still alive. The God that healeth thee, the, the God the healer, you know, all the, 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 the redemptive names of God through Jehovah, all of those, he's still alive. All of those still exist. He didn't change his personality. Just because that you go from one chapter that ends in Malachi and then starts in Matthew does not mean that his personality has changed. He still is who he is. And the people that he loves, that he's loved then, he still loves now. He still wants the best for you. He still wants to help you. Now watch this. I love this story. It's one of my favorite stories in, in all of the uh, Old Testament. Genesis chapter 30. I'm just going to read just a few verses here, starting with verse 25. So um, this is the story of Jacob and Laban. Jacob has been working for Laban because he, he's working to, to, to get uh, Laban's daughter for his wife. And he's really, really, really likes her, wants her. And so, you know, they've, he's worked for a long time for Laban. And then it kind of jumps in, in here in verse uh, 25. It says, and it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph that Jacob said to Laban, send me away that I may go to my own place and to my own country and give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you. So he's got Rachel and, and Leah and now he, he wants to get out, you know, and uh, leave his father-in-law's house. How many of you know it don't last very long when, the, uh, when you, you, your children and you, you know, uh, their husbands or wives, whatever it is, they live with you, right? Don't work that well for too long. And he's recognizing that, and he says, it's time for me to get out of here. He said, let me go, 
For you know my service which I have done for you. And Laban said to him, Please stay if I have found favor in your eyes, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. And then he said, Name me your wages and I'll give it to you. So Jacob said to him, You know how I've served you and how your livestock has been with me. For what you have you had before I came was little, and it has increased to a great amount, and the Lord has blessed you since my coming. And now... When uh, shall I also provide for my own house? So he said, what shall I give you? And Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. Now there's the creative idea. Here's the creative idea. Jacob could have said, just give me a check in the mail. Just make sure you pay me the right amount. I need more money than I got right now. Because that's what cattle was. Cattle and flocks are cash. Now we don't like to, we, I mean, people don't like you say the word cash in church. Because it feels like, oh. But that's cash. That was a, just a means of, of trade and a means of, of financial uh, capability. Y'all all right? I'm, I'm feeling like, I'm, I'm feeling like, I don't know, man, if, I'm, if I've sold you on this yet or not. Jacob said, you'll not give me anything, but if you'll do this for me, I will again feed and keep your flocks and let me pass through all the flocks t today, removing from there the speckled, the spotted sheep and all the brown ones among the lambs and the spotted and the speckles of the goats, and these shall be my wages. I'll take the spotted, speckled, and brown uh, sheep and cattle those are mine, your, yours are the rest. So my righteousness will uh, answer for me in the time to come when the subject of my wages comes before you. Everyone that is not speckled, spotted among the goats, brown among the lambs, will be considered stolen if it is with me. And Laban said, oh, that it were according to your word. Now he gets excited about this because he's like, they ain't, first of all, that many of them. I keep all the good ones. So he removed that day the male goats that were speckled, spotted, and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one of them that had some white in it, and all the brown ones among the lambs, and gave them to the hands of his son. Then he put three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. Now Jacob took for himself rods of green poplar and of the almond of the chestnut trees, peeled the white strips in them and exposed the white which was in the rods and the rods which he had peeled had set before the flocks in the gutters in the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink so that they should conceive when they came to drink so the flocks conceived before the rods the flocks before the streaked and speckled and spotted and then Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face toward the streaked and all the brown in the flocks of Laban but he put his own flocks by him by themselves and did not put them with Laban's flocks. So in other words, here's what he did. He's like, okay, don't pay me anything, but let's make an agreement. Now, where do you think the idea came from? Did he just come up with this on his own? Was the Lord speaking to Jacob saying, I have an idea for you. I have an idea for you that this is the way that you can get what, what's rightfully yours. He begins to put the, the, the flock in front of these speckled and streaked rods and, and things that he could create that when they're at the watering trough, and evidently that was a place where they would come to mate. And as they're mating, they get a vision as they look at something and while they are mating it's putting something on the inside of them to where their production their 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 offspring was coming out based upon the vision that they were seeing at the time now i would not have thought about that i i wouldn't i just would have i probably would have said look can we just cut them in half just split them in half i take half you take half can we is that a good deal but that wouldn't have been the best deal that god wanted for him because watch watch let me finish this. And then uh, 
And it came to pass whenever the stronger livestock conceived that Jacob placed the rods before the eyes of the livestock in the gutters that they might conceive among the rods. But when the flocks were feeble, he did put them in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger were Jacob's. Thus the man became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks, females, males, servants, camels, and donkeys. Now if he had just said, can we split them in half? He wouldn't have got the better end of the deal. And I believe at this particular moment, Laban had really taken advantage of Jacob and was not, had not kept his word on several occasions that God kind of was like, okay, all right, it's time for you. It's time for me to begin to let you get what's yours. And he puts an idea in his head and he said, because I want you blessed. They wanted Laban blessed too, but not dis, uh, deceitfully. When he began to be deceitful, God said, okay, my hand of blessing comes off, off of you because my hand of blessing was on you because of Jacob. And now you've treated, dis, uh, treated him disrespectfully and unkindly and, and, and you've not done what you should have done. That blessing comes off of you. And here you see that the blessing of God was available through an idea. And it says that he was exceedingly prosperous because God wants his people to do well. And I want to submit to you this morning that God wants you to do well. Not just so that you can do everything. That's not the goal. I just want to, I want you to get that inside of you that God wants me doing well enough in my life. I know I have heaven waiting. I know it's far superior. I know it's way better than what I'm experiencing now. But he doesn't want you in a place to where you're like struggling for survival. He still wants to be able to be Jehovah Jireh to you. Just like he wants to be Jehovah Rapha to you. He wants to be your salvation. He wants to be your healer. Let me just actually sum it up in this. He wants to be everything to you. He wants you to look to him on everything. And for you to have a confident expectation that he wants to help you. What happens? I mean, it, doesn't it feel odd to you? I know they, that's a strange thing, right? That's a strange way to... to to show somebody I'm going to provide for you. Hey, I'll give you an idea. Spotted, speckled, get that in front of the vision. In fact, as I was thinking over this, this is what, what I heard the Lord say when, uh, when I saw this and I was reading this. This is really a story within a story. God showed Jacob that in order for the flock to be his provision, that he needed to create a vision from the proposed provision. Meaning this. He gave him the idea that the flock was his provision, right? Does that make sense? The flocks were his provision. But his provision had to have a vision in order for it to become provision. And that was why I felt like the Lord was saying, sometimes I'm going to have to just give you a vision of your provision. And if you're open to a vision for provision, then God will put something in your heart. He'll show you something. He'll show you Bob creative ideas. He'll show you ways to, you know, to jumpstart and bypass and, He'll show you short, shortcuts and, and he'll show you some things that'll help you. Because after all, God is not, he doesn't want to see you suffering. He doesn't want to see you physically suffering. He doesn't want to see you suffer with the things that you have need of in life either. I'm just going to say this just really, really quick and close. I, I was, you know, I was raised, my mom knows, you know, what I'm saying is true. I guess we were poor, but I just didn't know we was poor. Y'all know what I'm talking about? It's like you think as a kid sometimes, you don't have a concept of stuff like this. 
you just didn't realize how poor that you was till you look back and you go, wow, I, I, I didn't have it so well. But I never ever didn't know, I knew that she always wanted me to have provision. I knew that she wanted me to have the best. But the problem was, there's a limitation as to what you can do sometimes. You're limited because you're human and you have limitations. And even though you may want to, sometimes you just can't do it because you don't have the, you don't have the ability to do it. The difference between you and your relationship with God and the difference between you and your relationship with your parents is obvious. God is capable. He can do everything. He can do anything. Do you believe that God loves you as much as your parents loved you or loves you? Well, doesn't he tell us, he says, what man among you, if his son or daughter asked for a fish, would give him a snake? Wouldn't it be something if Reagan came to him and said, Dad, I'm hungry. Can we go to Long John Silver's? I'm hungry for some Long John. We was talking about Long John. Long John's is great up to the moment that you, you've been thinking about it, and even to the minute you're eating it. But after you eat it, you wish you hadn't ate, ate Long John's. You don't know what I'm talking about, right? That's a true story. Reagan wants, a, he wants Long John's. And Jason goes up to him, he says, son, I have so much, something so much better. Grab this rattlesnake. This is awesome. I'm telling you, son, you're going to really enjoy this. How about a little bite of cobra? Nobody would do that, right? Or if, you're, if your child asked for a piece of bread and you said, bread? Bread? Oh, I got something far better. Take a bite of this rock. It's delicious. And he said, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, you know how to take them to Long John's, right? You know how to give them some good bread, some good cornbread. Mm. my wife does the best cornbread if you know you're evil and you know how to give a good gift to your children how much more will your heavenly father give you and do for you the problem is we don't really believe that we believe that our parents love us and will care for us and want us to have the best I believe that I believe my mom always wanted the best for me. I believe if she could have given me a million dollars, if she had a, well, I don't want to put her in a hole, but let me just say, if, if she had $1.1 million gift, I believe, and if I needed the million, she'd have said, you take the million, I'll take the hundred. I believe she would have, because she always wanted the best. I know she loves me and wants the best for me. How much more does God love you than she loves me? How much more does God love me than her? A lot. And I know she loves me a lot. But he loves me a lot more. But he look at me and go, heaven, son, don't ask for anything else. What else would you expect? I'm giving you heaven, boy. Don't, don't, don't ask me for any healing. Don't ask me to bless your bank account. Or don't ask me to give you the provisions that will make you be able to be sustained. Don't ask for any of that because after all, I've already done enough for you. Do you think that your parents would say that? If your parents wouldn't say it, then God wouldn't say it because he loves you more than your parents. Amen? I just believe that even though sometimes it might look strange, it's not always a check in the mail, it's not always the obvious just quit, quit trying to figure everything out and do what he told the lady that had to give up, you know, the bread or her, her last meal. There was one other instance where there was a woman that talk, came to the man of God and said, they're about ready to take my sons. My husband's died and they're taking my sons into slavery. 
And he said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to tell you something to do that this is a common practice. Go, what do you got in your house? And she said, I ain't got nothing other than a little cruise of oil. And he says, go borrow as many vessels, and I don't mean a few, but I mean go get a bunch of them. Go get a bunch of vessels. Can you imagine at the moment if that was you? Now, you have the story, so you know it's not weird. But they told you that. You've never heard of anything like this again. And they go, go get all the vessels you can get. Borrow them from everywhere you can find them. And all of a sudden, you're just going from house to house getting vessels. And you, they go, well, what, what can I ask why you need to borrow the vessel? I really don't know. But the man said, just borrow vessels. I really don't know. That's weird, right? But she brings it in and she goes, that's all I can get. And he says, now take what's in the cruise and start putting it in every vessel. And as she's doing it, every one of them starts filling up and it just, it's like, well, it should be empty by now, but, it, but it's not. And finally she says, my God, look, they're all full. I don't have any more vessels. What should I do? And he said, now go sell the oil and pay off your son's debt. And I've not ever seen anything like that. The Lord's never told me to go borrow some vessels from Pastor Wells and start filling in oil into them because I had a need. But that's the way that he chose to do it that particular day. I don't know what he'll tell you, but I know this. I know he wants to bless you. And he'll do something wonderful for you if you'll just say, I have no preconceived notions. I have no preconceived idea as to how God will do it. I just know this much. He loves me, cares for me, wants to meet my needs, and whatever he does, I'm open to doing it. If I hear his voice, I'm open to responding and do what he says to do. Amen? Let's pray.